All right, again, happy Tabernacles. All right, for those who are listening online now or later, it's just such a joy to be here with everybody. And um, yeah, it's been already really good so far. And as the week progresses, just that wave continues to rise and we just continue to rejoice in heavenly places. It's just really a taste of heaven. And because that Tabernacle is typical of heaven and tab when, when we will finally tabernacle with in, in the final type of it right in heaven where we're tabernacling it with 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 god and and his son and, and the redeemed um it's very fitting uh that i'll be speaking on and p well, part of the inspiration for a while i'll be speaking on a topic that is about in a sense heaven but heaven beginning here and eternity starting now Amen. so that's the title for the message, and um, yeah, so it's good to see a few new faces here already, and um, so Sean and Dana, welcome, and uh, yeah, all right, well, let's pray. Loving Father, awesome God, we just worship you, we praise you, we bless you, we thank you for being here with us and for filling this temple made of time with your presence, that we don't just get the Sabbath, we get, we get the Sabbath of the feasts and of this whole week, Lord, we get to just, um, just swim and just be immersed in your spirit and in your word and your angels are here with us, and I pray that they would, and trust that they are with us here tonight, to, to shield us in from the darkness that is in, in is trying to engulf our world that we would be in this little pocket this protected pocket of light of a heavenly atmosphere and that heaven would come down and touch our souls right now to this evening that we would go away changed and just in love with you and in desires of heaven in the future and 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 to begin right now as you will reveal to us tonight and i just thank you we love you and just pray that you would speak through me anoint my lips to speak your words and may these th these words not just be dry words but speak life, spiritual life, creative life in, in the listeners. And we thank you and we rejoice in this beautiful good news. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, yeah, there was, it was such a joy to prepare this message. I, it's, uh, I guess you... It, I already said that the official title, but the unofficial title is, I guess, like Presence of God Part 2, uh, Part 3 from, from what I had given. It's continuing in that line of inspiration, that line of thought that God has had me on this, this year. And it's just studying this to prepare for this message has really just been immersed in the presence of God and in heavenly places like to, 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 to bring this message to you tonight. And uh, it, it's just, it, it had really brought me to tears just preparing this message. And God had just really spoke to me. And especially during around the time of Day of Atonement, um, some of these thoughts were really starting to, to come through. And um, so one of the things, um, yeah, I'd like to start with... Um, and it's interesting, um, you, have, you have people out there, right, in the world. Uh, I remember I used to hang out in New Age circles and, and uh, there's this idea of, you know, this, this utopia, that they're, this, this heavenly utopia that they want to try and establish on earth. And they, they say no war and it's all going to be peace, right? You know, peace, guys, let's just have peace. And this, have the, trying, to, trying to create this heaven on earth kind of scenario. And, uh, and, and in some ways, the way that they're trying to accomplish it, especially without Christ as the only way to be able to accomplish this, is, is a pipe dream. And this, in the same way, we see a lot of the Sunday Christian world, they're trying to create this, this uh, or they have this, and a, a lot of the world, whether it's some messianic circles, other different circles have this idea of like a thousand year millennial, like heaven on earth, this peace on earth. But it's, it's, as we understand it, it's in heaven. And to try and imagine that to be here on earth is also a pipe dream. With all the wicked, there's it just, it, it couldn't happen. It's impossible. But is heaven just an experience that is in the future only after we die and are resurrected? Of course, for those who don't believe in the, you know, the non-immortality of the soul, right? For those 
of us who believe in the non-immortality of the soul, right? Is heaven just a place after we die or are resurrected or are translated, right? Or is there an element of that beginning here now? Yes. Right? So that's, that's, that's what I'll... Uh, a gist of kind of the theme of what I'll be sharing some thoughts on. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through, if you want to take notes of some of these verses, you can jot them down, but um, there might be a few verses that we go to a little slower, but I've written down these verses in my, in my journal here, and so I'll be going through some of these pretty quick just to get the uh, point across. Um, but first, starting in John 3, 15 and 16, this is one of the key verses that right, is very famous, one of the most famous verses quoted by Christians. And so John 3, 15, let's see here. Let's see. So this one we will, um, most of you know John 3, 16, right? But starting in John 3, 15, right, that whosoever believeth in him, right, the Son of Man, right, as Christ, as he's lifted up, right, should not perish, and that word perish means to destroy fully or to die, right, so will not perish but have eternal life, right, for God so loved the world, he gave his begotten Son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So believe it, to have faith, in trust, put uh, trust with. These are what it means. So, and in verse 36, right, it says that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, has everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And as we're understanding the wrath of God, God has to withdraw his protection and allow people to experience the bad consequences of their choices, right? So he that believeth not on the Son and the Son of God, and we'll see that this believing on the Son of God, this is essential to this as well. Not just God the Son or, or, or Jesus as a mere man or whatever. Yeah, the Son of God is very important there. So John 5, let's see. John 5, 22 is the next verse I want to go to. John 5, 22. All right? So, for the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So we've brought this verse up before, right? Saying that there's that the Father doesn't judge any man, he's given it unto the Son, but that later it says the Son judges no man. But then we see down here, it's interesting, if we keep following this, 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 if we don't just stop there, we go on to verse 24. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And that's even in the, in, the, in the verse of the, in the hymn that we just sang as well, too. So we're learning that, okay, the Father judges no man. He doesn't condemn any man. And then he that believeth on him that sent Jesus has everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, right? And is passed from death unto life. And that's in this life. So from spiritual death unto spiritual life in this life. So this is, this is a present reality that we can have. Okay? And then verse 26 is interesting also. So for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So I'm going to come back to this because this is also going to be a, um, a, th a thing here. So interesting enough. Okay. So the next verse I want to go to, John 10, John 10, 27 and 28, right? So this is talking about my sheep, they hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, they shall never die, or be destroyed fully. So this could be, this could be the second death, but it could also be this life, current life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Any man, any natural disaster, any self even, right? This, no man shall be able to pluck them out of my hand. Hallelujah, this is good news, right? So I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. So if, believe this. If we, I mean, if we can believe these promises when times get tough, that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing shall be able to pluck us out of the hand of God, that, our, our, love, our loving Heavenly Father's hand. Amen. John 12, 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. Right? He who seeks to save his life, heard this verse probably before, shall lose it. But he that hateth or detesteth loves less his life and loses his life for my sake in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. 
So this principle of self-defense, self-preservation, force, it's a law of nature that leads to what? It leads to war, it leads to death, it leads to sin, right? And it means only that, those things. But self-sacrifice, right? This is the principle of heaven. This is the principle of grace in the realm of grace, right? It's, it means peace. It means life. It means self-surrender, love, righteousness, and ultimately life, right? And so um, this principle here is, 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 is being uh, represented. And yeah, all right. So to be in Christ in his death, in his life, in his resurrection, okay? Uh, to be in Christ. Uh, John 17, okay, the next verse. John 17, 2 and 3. Okay, so the son is praying. This is his prayer to the father in Gethsemane. And this is that famous prayer, that beautiful prayer. And he's saying, glorify your son also that he might glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as believe upon him intelligently and experientially. This is life eternal. This is life eternal. This is a imp very important verse here, right? We, we love this verse in our message. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Right? This is, this is eternal life. Like, to, to, be, to begin, for eternal life to begin now, we have to know the Father and the Son. We have to know their character. We have to have, uh, and, and not just know intellectually, but learn it experientially and experience it and receive it into our own life and experience. So this is feeding into this theme. All right, then we have back to John 5.22, right? When it says, um, or not 5.22, 5.26, right? As the Father hath life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in himself. So for wanting this eternal, so it, it, and it's interesting because there's a quote in in uh, the writings of Ellen, Ellen White where she says, "In Christ was life original, unborrowed, and underived." Right? And some people try and say, "Okay, well uh, that that means he was, you know, like, you know, the Trinity God, right?" But if 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 you see that. That, this, that in Christ was life original, unborrowed, underived. So if you look at the original quote where that is found, this is, this, is what it talks, this is what it says. So this life is not inherent in man. This life original, unborrowed, underived. This, it's immortality, really. It's speaking to immo this immortal life. But it was in Christ, right? He can possess it only through Christ because it was, it was in Christ. As that verse said before, as the Father has life in himself, he's given to the, the Son to have life in himself. Okay? He can possess it only through Christ, the Son of God, right? This is, this is, we can only possess it through Christ, Jesus, the Son of God. He cannot earn it. It is a free gift if he will believe. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. And, and who is eternal life? Jesus. Jesus Christ. This is the true God, as 1 John says, and eternal life. Amen. Speaking of Jesus. Um, God, who only hath immortality, right? So, uh, but he's given that eternal life to be in his son. And when we possess the son, we have that eternal life dwelling in us. That it, 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 it then it can be ours. And so only by feeding on Christ's flesh and blood do we have the assurance of the divine nature of that eternal life. And what are we learning about the flesh and the blood? Right? We're feeding on his life, his spirit, his word. And so by feeding on this, and we receive of this, especially an extra portion on the feast of the appointed times, uh, it, it matters. Oh, okay, yeah. So all truth is vital. This, this next part is good. All truth is vital. It matters what we believe. We cannot surrender any with safety. We cannot with safety surrender any seed of truth in order to please yourself or anybody else. This is going to be very important because we might all claim to be on the same page right now. We might say, okay, we all, we're, we're coming to understand some similar truths, right? But if at any point we get under pressure by the world, by our friends, by our family, by the no buy, no sell market, the be stuff in the future, if we get under pressure to relinquish or compromise, and we might say, oh, well, I still believe this kind of, you know, but like we start, to, we start to surrender any seed of truth in order to please yourself or anybody else, this means death. 
It's, it's nothing to play around with. And, and so it's important to, to ask God, like, if this is true, Lord, like, and Jesus is the way of way the truth or life. We don't want to sacrifice or leave Jesus off for anything, right? So it's worth holding on to him and trusting that he will see us through whatever comes, come what may. And, um, and so if, if through faith man becomes one with Christ, as Christ is one with the Father, he can win life everlasting. God loves this, the redeemed sinner as he loves his own son. And this is just so profound. It's just so hard to wrap your minds around that the father loves us just as much as he loves his son. And even the sinner, he loves as much as he loves his son. And he that dwelleth in Christ and Christ in him, eat this bread of life, will live forever. So whoever eats this bread of life of Christ, right, will live forever. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak are spirit and they are life. And, uh, and then, yeah, the wine that we drink around uh, that is in extra portion uh, at the Tabernacles. I mean, the amount of wine at Tabernacles is huge. And uh, that sonship, right? Rejoicing in, in our sonship. And um, that's, that's a, a beautiful thing that my beloved son, daughter, in whom I, I delight. So, um, John, this is all, this is all, most of these verses so far have, 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 have been from the book of John. John 11, and we're going to go to the next verse, John 11, 25, 26. Jesus said, right, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, literally, or I would add spiritually, right, yet shall he live. And right, wasn't he speaking some of these things right around the time of tabernacles, right? Yeah, I mean, he is the bread of life, the water of life, right? Um, so it's also symbolic for the times that we're in. And get this, and whosoever liveth and believeth or trusteth in me shall never die. You wrap your, your minds around this, this thought, all right? So, so before he's saying, though he believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth, liveth, okay, and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Believe, he's asking the disciples, he's asking people there, believest thou this? Because who believed that? Who could actually believe those words? Throughout all of history, who could actually believe that they don't actually have to die? That, that God never destined man to die, that he could actually live forever. Right? Most, I mean, we have Enoch, we have Elijah, right? But... I don't think it's just arbitrary. God's like, nope, everybody has to arbitrarily die to be resurrected, to be saved. No, this, this eternal life has been available for everybody, but they, they just there was darkness in the world of an understanding of the character of God and of that character development that would be necessary in, in a knowledge, in a relationship with our, the Father and Son for God to be able to, to give that immortality to a, a man without receiving the, the physical death. This is what I'm getting to. Is that is not God's will that we actually would have to die to be resurrected to experience eternal life in heaven. So who, I mean, can we believe this today? And I think we're give, being given the tools, right, to be able to, to believe this and, re, and receive it. But had it at his time, who actually believed this? And I'm, and I'm thinking, we are, some of us are starting to think that maybe John actually truly believed this. Right? And we don't actually have a record whether or not like, he actually died or not. He might have died, but he, is it possible that John might have been translated? We'll find out one day. Right? It would be pretty cool if he's writing these things, all these things about eternal life. More than any other, I mean, I looked up all the verses basically in, in, in the New Testament and some in the Old Testament. It's like mostly John. That's speaking this. So I, I, I have faith to believe that it's possible that he didn't actually see death, but we'll find out. And all right, so so then we have um, verses like uh, okay, and then Martha said, "Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God." So um, Romans six twenty three: For the wages of sin is death, the wages of sin, not of God, right? But the gift of God is eternal life. First uh, John. 1 12 or 1 2 Jesus the word of life right this life was manifested and showing you the that eternal life which was with the father and manifested to us so speaking of Christ as that eternal life John 1 John three fifteen, he that has hate for a brother is a murderer and no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him 
So there's no death in Christ. And if we have any kind of hate or whether it's for others or God or that enmity has to die because if there's that enmity is still in us no there's no that that eternal life cannot be abiding in us um, in at least in its fullness of course God is still working with us and he's bringing us to that point where he can get all the enmity out so we can still have an experience with him now but um, so first John 5 the next one first John 5 11 so this is the record that God hath given us eternal life and this life is in his son these things have I written unto you that you might believe on the name or right character of the son of God that you might know that ye have eternal life can we have this assurance that we have eternal life right now right here right today that is assurance. If we, if we believe in the character and the love of our Heavenly Father, that He freely forgives us, we can have that assurance of eternal life today. And the Sunday churches, they're good at having that, that, that assurance of salvation, but it is, is with the seed of poison of, of this eternal security, like once saved, always saved kind of idea. And so, but it's a daily thing, experience that we have to, every day, receive of that assurance of the forgiveness of sins and the love of our Heavenly Father and our sonship and our daughtership and die to self. And then each and every day we can have that assurance of eternal life. And that eternal life will turn from mortal to immortal when the Son of God comes to take us home. And that you might believe on the name, the character of the Son of God. This is very essential to that eternal life. 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true even in His Son, Jesus Christ. So it's another way of saying you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yes, yes. And if we are hidden in Christ and Christ in us, right, we have that eternal life abiding in us as I've brought up before. And this is the true God and eternal life. All right. And then Galatians 6, 8. Six, eight. So to the flesh... And of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap, what? Life everlasting. So that's, that's what we want to be sowing. That's what we want to be investing in now. Um, all right. And also, uh, what I, the beautiful thing mm. is that on a daily basis, you know, we have to, we have to hold on to that assurance yes. that we are God's beloved sons and daughters, and therefore, mm -hmm. through the assurance of forgiveness, and that He'll provide for all our needs, and we have the assurance that He changes not. Yes. So the change isn't on His yes. part. Yes, the change is on our part. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, this next part that I want to share is, um, yeah. Just some thoughts here. So, so Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, right? Um, this is a good one. You can go there if you like. Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. This one's a good one for uh, heaven beginning now. All right. I have it written down here, so I don't need to look it up. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy or sacred. I dwell in the high and holy place with him or you with anybody that is also of a contrite or crushed and humble spirit to revive, right? And that word revive is so deep. It can mean give life, live, nourish up, preserve, quicken, recover, repair, restore, be whole, be saved. Is this, do we want this tonight? We knew, do we need this revival? Right? This is beautiful. This is, this is, there's a remedy in this for everybody. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So if we see our need, and we come to him and, 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 and all he asks for us to dwell in heavenly places is not that we're prideful. Like people be thinking that they high, you know, but they're not in heavenly places. But to be humble is to dwell with him also that is of a, a humble spirit and to, the, to dwell in heavenly places um, with him that inhabiteth eternity. And so God inhabiteth eternity. He's not bound by time, but if given our humanity, we're bound by time. We're going to get to, into some of these elements of time and how does this fit in with eternity. And so, let's see. All right. So, qualities of heaven. And, and, and Jesus said also, right, that... Some will say low here, low there, you know, the kingdom of heaven. But he says the kingdom of God is within you. And so God wants us to experience the kingdom of God within us 
today that his reign would be begin in our hearts and our lives now. And as we will see later on, well, as well as Daniel <laughs> brings out, right? Um, so you know, God dwelleth in in, in uh, um, uh, the heavenly tabernacle where Christ is ministering. Right? It's a temple made without hands. It's um, um, Stone, so Daniel 2 talks about a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, right? And this, this stone is the, the Son of God. He's cut out of the mountain, the Father. Smote the image, and the, and the stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And I always thought that this, this was just, and we going through evangelistic series, right? This is the second coming of Jesus, and that's going to, you know, crush the, the statue, and, be, and it'll fill the whole earth, and Christ will come down, and his kingdom will then, make, he'll make the new earth. And, and there's, there, there, that is true. There is that application, I believe. But is there also, right, this spiritual application where he's fitting us up to be spiritual temples uh, and made without hands? And that this, this stone, this, this kingdom that Christ is starting to form within his people, the spiritual kingdom or relational kingdom. But Jesus said, this kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. So it's, if otherwise my, king, my servants would fight. Right? So it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a relational kingdom. It's a character kingdom that's, re, that's to bring glory to his name. And this stone will already begin to smash the image Right, the, 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 that we see in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And, and spiritually speaking, and then literally when Christ comes, there will be the, the final uh, fulfillment of that. And, uh, and then it's interesting, in 8.25 it says, the, the, this, this wicked one right, will stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken with hand, out hands. And I just thought that was interesting, just, just a little plug for nonviolence there. Without, broken without hands. This is a kingdom that is being established without violence. And so, coming back to uh, the kingdom of heaven, beginning here and within our hearts. So, we want to understand a little bit just about what heaven is going to be like. And so, we can be getting to start to experience heaven now. And then we'll get into the attorney uh, starting now as well. So, first, first quality of heaven, right? The who, who will be there? Who, who, will be, who will we worship in heaven? One true God. One true God. Christ. And the only begotten Son of God, who is still the Son of God, right? There will only be, there's only, there's not a third throne in it. There's not a third throne in there for the Holy Spirit. We're going to be worshiping the Father and the Son. And there's many quotes in, um, in Spirit of Prophecy where the Father and the Son alone are to be worshipped. There's, there's quotes like that. And so, but we have um, also, the, you know, we'll be with the angels, we'll be with the redeemed. Uh, for who we will fellowship with um, and hopefully our loved ones hopefully all of us right I pray all of us are there in heaven I, and uh, let it be according to our faith the faith of Jesus in us now so we so so who will we be worship okay we answered that one now um, what um, what will be the condition of of uh, things there right no more death, no more destruction, right? No more violence, no more discord. All is love, all is life, all is light. There's nothing between us, nothing between our Savior and no us. No miscommunications, no condemnation. No condemnation. Um, it's beautiful, right? Um, and Isaiah eleven nine 9 describes this nonviolence in heaven where, in the new earth, right? It says, they shall not hurt nor destroy, what? In, in all my holy mountain. And, and um, that, the mountain that comes down and, and covers the whole earth, like I talked about in, in Daniel, right? And for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we all have a knowledge of the character of the Father and Son. We will experientially enter into that, which is completely nonviolent. Oh, no, the, Isaiah eleven nine: They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Thank you. You're welcome. So, what is the diet going to be like? Plants, baby. Will we have a heavenly butcher? No meat on the golden street. <laughs> There'll be no more death, right? We won't need to feed on death to, to have life. So, so the Eden diet, whole food, plant-based diet, we're not even going to have like processed plant treats anymore. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, maybe we'll have some form of like, you know, cooking and preparing food, but it'll be wholesome. It's not, there's going to be no bad stuff in it, right? Um, 
and it will be amazing. So the food is going to be absolutely awesome. And um, no forever chemicals. No forever chemicals. <laughs> yes. No. no uh, anyways, all the other stuff that goes with that that scene. So on this top on this topic, Sharina shared a really int. Where's Sharina? Okay, yeah. You should, I appreciate that. was awesome. High five. This is fitting in perfectly for this message here. I love this quote. I hadn't seen this before. So SD, SDP 86.1. So there was a time when the lion and the lamb played together and man was given dominion over the beasts of the earth. Okay, so we know this dominion of the earth principle, right? And it was only after sin entered and man took the life of the beasts that they in turn sought to destroy man. Hmm. And why do you think they would have took the life of the beast? Sacrifice. Yeah, well, obviously there was, uh, there was sacrifice, but then there was also to eat. They would have started eating meat before the flood. We know this. Is it? So the loss of the flood. Yeah. So they would have started to eat meat. Or, or maybe they, they feared, you know, the animals would start. There was enmity now, and maybe they feared. This one has big teeth. Yeah, this one has big teeth. Yeah, maybe I should, you know, get him out. You know, maybe he could be a threat to me. So, trophy hunting. Or trophy hunting. Okay, yeah. So, you, so man begins to take the life of animals, and then the animals then begin to take the life of man when they hadn't before. So... Harmony with God will finally restore man to his God-given place as king of the beasts. That dominion of the earth principle will be restored. Not just in heaven. I believe this begins now. Have you experienced this with the animal kingdom? Yes. Yeah, we were just talking about that today. How, you know, you see these videos where even though the animals probably normally have some sort of fear of humans, when they're in dire straits, they come to humans. Mm. Mm. Because I think the animal kingdom knows mm. that we were here to help them. Yes. And that even though there are some bad people, you know, you'll see them wrapped up in nets or whatever. Mm -hmm. or, their, or their baby is stuck in a drain pipe and they come and they, they come to humans for help. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they can especially tell. I think they can sense a spirit or an atmosphere around us. Totally. Horses respond to this. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Amen. And, uh, and have you ever walked up to a house with dogs? I mean, I do this with canvassing. And I, I, we go to plenty of houses with dogs. And it's like sometimes it's a test of faith to be like, okay, we're going to stay calm. Lord, you're going to protect us. You're with us. We need to go talk to this person. And they're, you know, sometimes you're like, are they going to bite me? But I so far haven't gotten bit. And if I did get bit, I know that it would not be unto death and that it would be a divine appointment somehow, some way. So I'm not worried about it. But... Um, Fight shall not be under death. <laughs> so, 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 okay, the, the quote continues. So man is finally restored to, to his place as king of the beasts. Daniel's heart was beating with the heart of God. And when he's thrown into the den of lions, right? And when he entered the den, the beasts were at peace with him. Amen. It's a beautiful story. And it's just, all these things were written as in samples for those who shall live at the end of the world. The unity of feeling is shown in the fact that an angel was visible and Daniel talked face to face with the heavenly visitor. Now here's the punchline. This is the reason to be vegetarian. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Because if Daniel had actually eaten meat, this I don't have proof of this. It said he didn't eat the meat that was offered to idols. It's possible that he, they say, some people try and say, well, he didn't eat, he ate meat that was not sacrificed to idols. I argue that I think he just ate the pulse and the, the food that he asked for um, the beans and the vegetables and the, these, these, these plant-based foods. So I don't, I don't think the, I think the lions could not smell any kind of animal in him or, or, or the hormones of any animals in him. And I think that they didn't sense him as a threat. And obviously it wasn't just him being vegetarian. I, it's my theory, but also of course his spiritual connection and that heavenly atmosphere and the angels protection that he had. So some might say, well, if I just have a connection with God and I'm not vegetarian, I'll be okay. I would suggest, this is my theory, so in the end, end time, and I believe it's more than theory, I think if we want to be a part of those that are translated without seeing death, and we want heaven to begin now, and prepare for that heavenly eat in it diet, it's time to begin this now, 
So to be protected from animals, so if we want to be a part of that number, I think it's going to be important. So after sin entered, right, and by taking the life of animals to eat them, they now naturally fear man, seek to destroy him. So to be in greater harmony and dominion with the animals, I think we need protection through being vegetarian so that they don't smell like the, the um, they, don't smell death. they don't smell death in us, they don't smell other animals in us, they don't smell those hormones, right? They don't see us as a risk to them. And so that we can be at greater peace with them. And uh, so, but if, but if we're meat eaters, this is my, this is, this is my word of caution. In the last days, but if we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ, if we're eating meat, I think that we have a risk of animals, the wild animals, sensing us as a threat and potentially taking our life. So that's the way we could potentially lose our life. Um, uh, so that's the diet. Then when shall we worship? From one Sabbath to another, from one new moon to another. Yes, yes, from one Sabbath to another, one new moon. And potentially, we'll, you know, there might be some yearly, there may likely be some yearly appointments in heaven as well, too. And Sabbaths within those yearly appointments. Yes. It is true, one Sabbath to another. Yes, yes, amen. And uh, so what will be the character of the inhabitants be? Right? Reflection of God's own character. Yes, a reflection of the character of the Father and the Son, and, uh, and the atmosphere of heaven. Like, what will that be like? So, we will be like Jesus and the Father. There will be the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering. Those fruits will be fully mature in our life. And 1 Corinthians 13, that love chapter, that love of the Father and Son, that love will be in us, and that love will be for one another in, in, in its maturity. And we'll, that love will continue to grow and expand for all of eternity. So it's just still hard to imagine. Um, and then, yeah, there's no more resistance, no more sin. We'll all still be truth seekers. And any, because any, not everyone's going to be perfectly up to speed on everything in heaven. There's going to be still some, some growing in the truth. But, but there's not going to be resistance to that. That, that, that everyone's in harmony with the spirit of the Father and the Son and in their sonship and daughtership. And they know they're only there by the merits of, of Christ and uh, new covenant relationship. And uh, so no more discord. We're going to be all one big, happy, heavenly family. And I just look forward to that day. And I just, I just hope by meditating on these thoughts of heavenly places, right, that we can desire this to begin here now. And don't we experience this at the feast a little bit? A, a, just a, a, a small taste of what it's going to be like in heaven? I mean, isn't this just like a little taste of heaven, a heavenly atmosphere? And, and it's just so precious. And you all are so precious to me. And uh, it's just... Uh, I, I, I look forward to bringing more people to these events just so that they can experience this a little taste of heaven that it doesn't have to be like the way that they thought it has been or ever will be. That there is hope of a better way. There is hope of, of a community that it, it is a taste of heaven. They can see that, wow, this is nice. Like, I want this for eternity, right? And, and if we're not in harmony with that now, as Ellen White says also, like, Heaven would be a place of torture for the wicked if they are not used to experiencing the presence of God, the presence of the Son, and a love for the truth now. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody doesn't enjoy being here, there could be a sign that there's still room for that relationship with our Heavenly Father to be stronger. And, and, and it's something that comes with time. You know, we, I had to pray when I came out of the world. I was coming out of, you know, you, most of you know my story. I was coming out from a life of excitement and partying in the world and, and just the music festivals and all this stuff. And it literally took a heart change. For one, that, that was the main thing to help me enjoy spiritual things again. But the other thing was just took time. It just takes, just like some food you eat the first time you don't like it, but you eat the food, healthy food enough, you start to like the food. Your, our taste buds change. Our spiritual taste buds change. And so, like many of us experience, like we look forward to this all year long because this is such a beautiful experience. And so it takes time to get used to the culture of heaven. And, 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 but once we... It, once God can get that earthliness, that dross, that worldliness out of our lives, we can pray the prayer, help me to love what you want me to love and hate what you want me to hate, then this will be the best experience we could ever ask for. And, and we'll just be begging, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll be like, yes, heaven. Like, I long for that day. I look forward to it. And we have heaven in our hearts. And so um, we're going to 
there's a few more thoughts there, but um, so, all right. So theme, what is going to be the theme of meditation, thought, and conversation in heaven? Philippians 4, verse 8. Many of you know this, this, this verse, right? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, dwell on these things, right? Because in heaven, everything's going to be true. There's going to, no, going to be no more lies in heaven, right? Praise the Lord. Like we're living in an age of so much disinformation, it's hard to know what's truth. We have the Word of God. We know that that's our anchor. But everything in heaven is going to be true. And honest, right? There's going to be, you know, what a, what a beautiful thing. that Everything's going to be honest. There's going to be, um, I guess that's kind of, there's going to be that trust. Uh, yes, amen, absolutely. And everything's going to be just and fair. There's going to be no more injustice, no more unfair ta taskmasters and, and whatever, you know. Everything's going to be fair and... Um, Pure. It will be everything in heaven will be pure. There will be no impurities in us or in the creation. Everything will, will, will be pure and lovely. Everything will be absolutely lovely beyond beautiful that we could ever imagine. Anything and a place you'd want to visit on this earth in heaven is going to be that it, way exponentially better. Eye has not seen nor ear has heard the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And of good report. <laughs> everything will be good news like wow like can you imagine that like when you turn on the news channels you turn on the these you know these doom and gloom reporters and it's just it's just so much bad news like wouldn't it be good that like anytime you're getting news it's good news you know like yes that's awesome um actually there's a there's a good news uh um like a, like a newspaper. Uh, uh, anyways, they're, they label themselves as a good news reporter. They're trying to focus on like actually good news stories. I don't think they're necessarily Christian, but uh, I thought that was kind of clever. All right. And then if there be any virtue, right, virtuous, um, if there be any praise, all will be praised to God and His Son. Dwell, think and dwell on these things. Why? Because heaven is all these things. And so why not experience this now? Why not let our conversation be in heaven now? Why not let our, our thoughts be on, begin to focus? Not saying we don't pay attention and, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there from all this stuff. We need to stay, but our main focus, our main emphasis is on these things because we're wanting to experience heaven now. We're wanting to live in the atmosphere of heaven and have those, those thoughts now to bring heaven into our experience so, why not begin now? What will our purpose, work, and mission be? And what will we do? How will we spend our time for all eternity? Uh, I don't think we can fully have an answer for that. We don't really fully know all this, right? But we'll explore other worlds. We'll visit. We'll share testimonies with other worlds of what the Lord has done for us. We'll get to explore God's creation. We'll get to, I mean... Um, I just want to read just a little bit here from the last chapter of, of uh, The Great Controversy, and I recommend um, reading The Great Controversy or this last chapter for yourself. Uh, but it's just, it's just a really, really beautiful thing to, to meditate upon. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't it say like we'll plant vineyards? Plant vineyards. Yes, exactly. We'll, so we'll still do farming. We'll have. We'll, yeah, we'll build a country home for for ourselves and our family. You know, there will be plenty of things to keep us busy, and it will be. But it won't be with the pain and the 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 pests and the whatever that we have to deal with now. Um, before I go to this, though, what will we wear? <laughs> Robes of, robes of righteousness, robes of life. Is it is it not robes of light made of linen also? Maybe we'll find I don't out. know. We'll find out. I'm wearing my linen pants tonight. So, um, but uh, yeah. So and so this is the this is some of those thoughts here, right? Okay. So the redeemed shall know even as they are known, right? Um, the pure communion with holy beings and the blessed angels, the faithful ones, and uh, the sacred ties. Right, uh, these constitute the happiness of the redeemed. Their immortal minds will contemplate with never failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There will be no cruel, deceiving foe to attempt to forgetfulness of God. Every faculty will be developed, every capacity increased. The acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There, the grandest enterprises may be carried forward. I can't, I can't even fully imagine. The loftiest aspirations reached. The highest ambitions realized? Whoa. 
and still there will arise new heights to surmount, just constantly leveling up. New wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of mind and soul and body. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle at, at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, on their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of his power displayed and the years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ as knowledge is progressive so will love reverence and happiness increase the more men learn of God the greater will be their admiration of his character as Jesus opened before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan the hearts of the ransom thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy, they sweep the hearts of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness through the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that... God is love. God is love. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, with revelations such as this, like, don't we want to be there? Amen. And don't we want to experience as much as heaven has to offer us right now? Yeah. Right here and right now? Because some, some try and just spiritualize heaven away, like, oh no, it's just, it's, 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 heaven, heaven is here and there's no, there's no heaven up in the sky and Jesus coming down in the clouds. Well, you know, they think this is some pipe dream for us. No, this is, that's a reality. But the reality is also that we're not just putting off heaven until then. Like, oh yeah, that would be nice. It, we need to experience this now and invite heaven into our hearts. And there's quotes where, um, I have it here, right? The definition of heaven is the presence of Jesus. And another one that I like here that talks about heaven beginning now. This one is, as through Jesus we enter into rest, heaven begins here. We respond to his invitation, come unto me and, and you know, come unto me and uh, I'll give you rest, right? Um, take my yoke upon you, that, that invitation, right? And learn of me. And in thus coming, we begin the life eternal. And get this, heaven is a ceaseless approaching unto God through Christ. Amen. The longer we are in the heaven of bliss, the more and still more of glory will be open to us. And the more we know of God, the more intense will be our happiness. As we walk with Jesus in this life, we may be filled with his love, satisfied with his presence. All that human nature can bear, we may receive here, now. But what is this compared to the hereafter? Life more abundantly. Life more abundantly. Where is that um, That was from the invitation from Desire of Ages. Yeah. So, uh, so our conversation, citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, as, as Jesus said, right, uh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this kingdom of heaven, Jesus um, is, is speaking about. And there's a lot of verses about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. We don't need to go into all those. Um, but I already mentioned the one before, the kingdom of God is within you. And, uh, or in your midst, I mean, because Jesus was, and other translations translate it in your midst, but because he was there uh, with them, and Jesus is symbolic of that. Um, so the next part I want to get to, this is really profound. I'm starting to wind things up here. This is really profound. So um, when we, when, okay, so we think of, Oh, okay, we kind of, I kind of brought it up before, right? So heaven, 
Um, we experience heavenly culture here now. And you go around the world. It's not just here in America. You go around the world. And I've been to Philippines. I've been to Africa. Heavenly culture is heavenly culture. It transcends all culture. Amen. Right? And so it, it, it's like that, that church family, that heavenly atmosphere, the music, the food, the, the modest dress, all these things are, are you, it's very similar wherever you go in the world. And it's beautiful. It's like you're meeting family. Even though you haven't, you've, you, it's the first time you're meeting them, but it's like you've already met family family. And, uh, and that's, that's the culture of heaven that we get experience even here on this earth when we go to other places. And so we think of this verse um, where, um, where Jesus said he's broken down the middle or uh, in in the New Testament, right? Broken down the middle wall of separation. All right, I'm trying to remember. Is that in Hebrews? Um, Acts. Acts? Okay, maybe it is an axe, right? Um, so, right, so we think about, like, there's so much division here in this world, right? We, so, if we think about, you know, the rich man and Jesus, he said, what shall I do to earn a, a, a eternal life? And he says, sell what you have. And, you know, but, so, is it worth leaving? Is it worth leaving family, friends, tribalism, political party, denomination. Heavenly culture transcends all of this, and we will always have a family, even if our earthly parents don't come along on the journey with us. We will always um, have this. And so, um, this broken down this middle wall of separation, right? And, and Adrian had a really beautiful quote, and, and I, 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 I did a little bit of a, um, a text or speech to text of my own, just to this little section that I thought was really profound, and then my final closing thoughts that, that this kind of spurred some really, it was a really profound moment for me. And so, um, so he's talking about this middle wall of partition being, uh, this wall of separation being broken down. This is not just between Jew and Gentile. Yes, I think there's some application there, but it's between us and God. That, that separation, that sin which is separating us and those misunderstandings about God and his kingdom and his character and, and the mediation of Christ as our mediator is breaking down that, that, that middle wall. And that veil was torn when Christ died, right? Between the holy and most holy place. And so... This law of commandments, so abolishing in his flesh, Christ's flesh, the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, or that means death decrees. So death decrees. So it's, it's without getting into study of all of this, right? So death decrees and, and thinking that the breaking of a law, like as Satan said, every sin must be punished. And so he's, he's, that enmity is being slain in Christ in his flesh. And we all have this sentence of death in ourselves. We all have this sentence of So Adrian's speaking this. And he says, We have all done things that we judge ourselves worthy of death. The one who judges himself worthy of death, what does he do? Things worthy of death. Right? Sins. He sins. Right? And this is very profound. He self-destructs. Right? Sin is the manifestation of a man or woman who believes they are going to die. I'm going to say that again. It's very profound. Sin is a manifestation of a man or woman who believes they're going to die. Why do people sin? And, and I know that there's deeper implications. I mean, there's, there's other factors involved. We have a sinful nature and we have to learn to experience walking by faith and trust and not just by our feelings. Yes? Kind of like the, you only live once, right? Like, just live it up now because you're gonna, we're going to die one day, right? That's the kind of the I deserve death, so, I, so I'm just going to live it up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I remember, uh, not to put this, I'm not going to say her name, I don't even think I can remember her name, but I had a manager at one of my jobs when I was younger, um, he used to like to drink soda, and she was like, oh, if I die drinking this soda, at least I'm going to die happy. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Well, that's how some people think about saying, oh, it makes yes. me happy. So. YOLO. YOLO, you only live once, yeah. So, so, and so if, if, we, if we have this self not we've done sins, and we think we, we have, and especially if we have a misunderstanding of God's character, we're going to have this idea that, oh no, I'm going to die. And so, okay, well, yeah, like we're talking about, they, so the, this, the, we self-destruct. And that self-destruction could be through the reverse of, I'm going to be prideful, and I'm going to, you know, do everything I can to make the most of this life and prove myself in this identity crisis, right, that, that people have. Um, so it's this worthlessness, and this worthlessness can be in the, oh, I'm nothing, or trying to be everything, right? It can manifest both, both ways. And so to understand and experience God's, this is my, this is my, my thoughts uh, as I was reflecting on this, to understand and experience God's true nonviolent character, to be in a new covenant relationship with the Father and the Son, 
by His promises and to receive of His Spirit on the Sabbath feast in the appointed times is the key to eternal life beginning now in Christ. How can we be translated without seeing death? How can we be this mortal put on immortality without having to go through that physical death experience? We stop believing in a God of death. Isn't this good news that we're learning that God is not a God of death? There's no death. There's no violence. No condemnation to Him. This is absolutely good news. We stop. We can, we can be translated without seeing death because we stop believing in a God of death. And we experience this experientially. We stop believing we deserve, we stop believing we deserve to die because we are in harmony with God and His character and His laws and His commandments. We, are no, we no longer fear death because there's no fear in love. For perfect love casts out fear, for fear involves punishment. It involves, so we fear because, oh no, we think we're going to get punished. If not by man, we think that God's going to punish us. Well, God is wanting to deliver us from this fear so we can completely walk in love. And what's that verse that says that um, they, their whole lifetime, they're, they're, those, their whole, yeah, those who fear death, something, right? Their whole, life. their whole lifetimes are subject to bondage. And if we think about, and I'm not going to go too deep into this Kronos idea, but it, simply put, right, when did time begin in another sense other than the, you know, time passing by, right? When did time in another sense begin? When sin entered. When sin entered and man then feared to die. Once man, the sin and enmity came into man, now there is a fear of death because when time runs out, oh no, I die. And so what? Revelation 12, it says that the dragon uh, came, was cast on the earth and he knew that he had a short time. Yes. He had great wrath. So he was, he's going to milk the last few years uh -huh. of his reign on this earth. Yes, yes, yes. So... If, if we are believing in a God of death still, and we fear that at the end of, the you know, end of time, oh no, if I'm not right with God, I'm going to die, I'm gonna, you know, then we're still going to be living in fear. But if we, can begin to believe, if we can believe in a God of life, right, then we lose that fear of death. We can lose that fear of death now, and we can lose that bondage. We can live this life completely free. We're not, we're, we're not afraid to live for God, courageously, boldly for God, whatever God would call us to do, however dangerous it seems to be, because if it's His will, He's called us to it, He'll get us through it. We're not fearful. We can truly live for God at this point. We don't fear death from man, from beast, from natural disaster. We can truly, as Psalms 91 and the other promises, do we believe these promises? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High in His presence shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We shall not fear. We shall not be touched. We shall not be able to be killed. This is a beautiful thing. It's just good news. And this can be our experience. So, we no longer believe we will die or that God is going to kill us. We stop self-destructing or contributing to other people's destruction. We trust our Heavenly Father and believe He will protect and preserve our lives from men, natural disasters, spiritual forces. Right? That we enter into that divine pattern that shields us from spiritualism, the key to obedience that allows the life of God to dwell in us and His children, that written word in our lives. And we enter into the eternity of heaven where time loses its power over us in the fear of death. And like Enoch, we are living in the presence of God, atmosphere of heaven on earth. We're constantly in communion with our Heavenly Father. And, and um, I have just one little final quote I'm going to read about Enoch as I, as I, as I conclude this. And uh, that, okay, so that we, we live in, like Enoch, in the presence of God in the atmosphere of heaven on earth. We believe God wants us and wills us to live. That death was never in His plan, and that becomes our reality. We have the privilege, opportunity to be part of that number that are fully reflects the character of God in the last days and can successfully endure the hell of the last days hidden in Christ, Christ in us, and thus be translated to heaven without seeing death. We are not worthless. We are children of the heavenly King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To lose that fear of death and its importance to not... It, so to lose the fear of death is important to not be living in open sin which causes a breach and we lose a sense of the presence of God and there's a human demonic fear of punishment or death. Without reconciliation, resolution, forgiveness, restoration in Christ, it can lead to counterfeit comforters and self-destruction. And when we get to Jacob's time of trouble, right, if we may have certain feelings or thoughts 
Some may not be of our own. But we have learned to trust our Heavenly Father and walk by faith in God's promises. And when at that point, when we're being tested with, with, with feeling like we're separated from God and Satan's going to be trying to, to, to do anything that he possibly can to get us to lose our grip on God. And I love that quote that Sabrina shared where it was about uh, Ellen White and she was on the, 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 the boat and the boat was sinking and the lady was like, are you not scared or whatever? And she's like, if it's my time, it's okay. You know, I can sink to the bottom of the ocean. I, you know, I'll, I'll be saved. I'll be good. But then she said, but if God will me to live. He has a plan for my life. There's not a single wave. There's not a, not all the water in the ocean could drown me or this ship. And so we're going to be able to say that, and we're going to have that confidence in God in the last days. But what Satan is trying to do in, is his chief effort in all of our all this life to do anything, whether it's pride, whether it's um, you know all these pleasures of life, or whether it's 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 afflictions of whatever kind, to do anything that he can to to give us to let us um, remove our hold, our grip on God. That's that's his chief purpose to try and get us to lose hold on God, and so to try and tempt us that maybe you're oh you've committed a sin that's too great for God to be forgiven for God to forgive you right but if we understand that there's no sin too great for God to be forgiven that we believe that we're fully forgiving and we're walking in that relationship then in that time that temptation is not going to have any power over us no matter what our feelings are we're going to hold on to God our faith that all heavenly all earthly support will be cut off our heart and our faith that through that cord of faith will be in heaven and that will that cord of faith and in, in God's word will hold us through those last days and then we will enter in we will be those who are part of that number and Illinois says we should, we should pray to be a part of that number. If we're martyred, if we are die and resurrected in heaven, great. Praise the Lord. We're there. And that's, that's all we could ask for, right? But we should aim for the highest ideal, that closest possible, most intimate relationship with God. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's you know, that, that ideal that we should, we should aim for. And this just last little quote here. So let's talk about Enoch, right? So he educated his mind and heart to ever feel that he was in the presence of God. Day by day, he longed for a closer union with God, that purity of heart, that harmony with heaven. Nearer and nearer had grown the communion with, uh, communion with God until God took him to himself. And I, I just this brought me to tears when I first was reading this. He stood at the threshold of the eternal world, like just imagining, like Enoch. You know, he's just, he has that most intimate walk with his heavenly father. And you could just imagine them. He's, he's here on this earth, but he's on the threshold of the eternal world. Just imagining that experience. And, and he's just one, one, just one moment away from being with God in heaven. I mean, and, and he's almost saying, God, I, I love you. I want you. I want nothing more than to be in your presence for all of eternity. Like, and God, and, and he's on that portals, uh, and the portals were open. And the walk with God so long pursued on earth continued and he passed through the gates of the holy city, the first from among men to enter there. To such communion, God is calling us. And I just, I just pray that we can have that love that Enoch had for his Heavenly Father, that love for that constant communion, that sweet communion, that, that, that of his presence with us always, and that we will be able to have, this will be ours. And so that, those are the thoughts I wanted to share with you and I, and I trust and pray that it was an inspiration and that your hearts are pricked and that every, every heart I pray here would respond to that invitation and, and, let, and let Christ into our heart because Christ is the definition of heaven. Let him into our hearts and let him bring that heavenly experience into our lives now and, and let him forgive us and cleanse us because he freely forgives us. There's, so it's, and we're sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. So, Amen. amen. So we'll have a closing prayer. <sighs> Loving Father, awesome God, it is such a privilege, it is such an honor to worship you and to be in this place and to have such beautiful revelations of your kingdom, of, of heaven, and the heaven that you want to begin in our hearts. And I just thank you, Father, for your presence being with us. I thank you for inspiring us of what is possible in our experience in a relationship with you. A glimpse of what heaven is going to be like so that our hearts would desire that the things of this world would go strangely dim in the light of your glory and the grace, that we would talk more of you and that we would have more of your presence because of having our mind and our thoughts continually upon you in every decision of life. You only want to bless us more than we want to be blessed. And I thank you, Father. Help us to, to make that complete surrender to you so that we can live without fear. We can live in your love 
and develop in us that faith. We, we need to this experientially, Lord, to go through these last days and that when people can meet us, they can get a sense, a taste of that heavenly atmosphere and they could desire that in their life and we could bring heaven, an experience of heaven to others and uh, prepare them for that eternal world and that, the new earth. And so we thank you so much. We love you. Give us a good night's rest tonight and may the rest of this tabernacles, may we continue to experience just a little of that uh, taste of heaven. So thank you so much and we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus, your son. We love you and thank you for your lo great love towards us. Amen. 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 Alright, over that we have a hymn for this occasion. Revive us again. Amen. <laughs>